Now, tomorrow afternoon, Chris Yoon and his ex-wife Vicky Price will be sentenced at Southwark Crown Court. Mr Justice Sweeney has told them to have no illusions about the severity of the punishment they should expect. That's legal speak for a probable jail sentence. The original scoop that Ms Price took the former Cabinet Minister's speeding points was broken by Sunday Times political editor and Sunday politics panellist Isabel Oakshot. In a moment, I'm going to be talking to her, but first here's our Adam on how the story unfolded. It started with a chance meeting at the Lib Dem party conference in Liverpool in 2010. In the queue for security, the Sunday Times political editor Isabel Oakeshott was introduced to the Greek economist Vicky Price. She'd recently been dumped by her husband of 26 years, the Energy Secretary Chris Hune, who'd begun a relationship with his press advisor Karina Trimingham. Oakeshott and Price became friends. Weeks later, they met for a coffee. It became clear that Vicky Price wanted revenge on Chris Hune. She handed over a pile of documents detailing his financial assets. She also said that he'd had haircuts costing £75 each and had hired a consultant to tell him what colour of shirt and tie he should wear. Embarrassing, but the Sunday Times didn't think there was a public interest in publishing it. Weeks after that, the ex-wife and the journalist came to this restaurant for lunch. It's closed for refurbishment, but it's still got the name above the door. Over a lunch of sea bass and Caesar salad, Vicky Price made her confession. Years before, she'd done something illegal. She'd taken the points for a motoring offence that had actually been committed by her husband. In 2003, Hune was an MEP. While driving back from Stansted Airport, he was caught by this camera on the M11. He was driving a black BMW with personalised plates. And so began an email exchange between Oakshot and Price at all hours of day and night, lasting for months. Vicky Price wrote of her ex-husband, I definitely want to nail him. She said that she'd spoken about the speeding points with her friends, including Miriam Clegg, the wife of the Lib Dem leader, and the business secretary Vince Cable and his wife. They've all since denied hearing anything. Vicky Price had spoken to the Mail on Sunday too. Isabel Oakeshott convinced Price that the story should belong to her paper. But the Sunday Times needed proof and so Isabel Oakeshott met Vicky Price at this London tube station and handed over one of these so she could coax her husband into making a confession. We can talk about this another time, face to face, when you want to. But I you don't. Want to I, stop there's nothing to do with face to face. To press, to face. I suggest you stop telling the press silly, silly things. All right. Excuse me. This I, has nothing to do with me either. No confession there, but they went ahead. Isabel Oakeshott wrote, "This story will bring Chris down if you're prepared to go on the record." She warned it carried a risk of prosecution. And so they agreed that the Sunday Times would name Hune, but not Vicky Price. Then the story exploded. Court is where the story went next, after Vicky Price and Chris Hune were charged with perverting the course of justice. He denied the allegations for more than a year, until the eve of his trial. I've pleaded guilty today. I am unable to say more while there is an outstanding trial. The next day, Vicky Price arrived for the start of her trial. She admitted taking the points and said she'd been coerced by her husband. For a fortnight, the court heard intimate details of her marriage. One of the witnesses was Isabel Oakeshott, who said she felt deeply conflicted during her day in the witness box. Then another twist. The jury couldn't reach a verdict and the trial had to be held again. This week, after 12 hours of deliberation, a second jury decided that Vicky Price was guilty, although she and Christian will have to wait to hear their sentence at a later date. We now know that'll happen tomorrow, perhaps an end to this saga of a man, his marriage, his mistress and the media. And Isabel's with me now. Now, there wasn't one uh, woman, but two women out to get Chris Hewn. We know Vicky Price wanted to destroy him, but why did you? Well, my focus was very much on Chris Hewn as a cabinet minister who was 
guilty, we now know, of committing a criminal offence. He was a serving cabinet minister and this was a very serious allegation. So my focus as a journalist was exposing that. But at one point in the emails you write, mm. I just want the story out so that he has to resign. And then you said, I, I'd like to topple him. It's almost personal. Well, um, the reason I wanted the story out was because I knew that Vicky Price was telling the truth about what had happened. And of course, it was an incredibly difficult story for us at the Sunday mm. Times to run. Because and she you, didn't want to be the seen as the source. Sure, and, and for understandable reasons. And you can see from the, that incredibly lengthy personal correspondence how much thought we put mm. into how to get the story out there. And it was a frustrating process sometimes. But at one of the many times when she was <clears throat> reluctant to spill the beans, you wrote to her, for now he is safe and, you can, stu and can still dream of being party leader. I mean, you were, you were winding her up, egging her on. Well, I certainly wanted to get the story out there, and I was in no doubt that she wanted to get the story out there. I mean, you know, you can see from those emails that she was very emotional at times, mm. but she never wavered from her objective, which was getting the allegation out there. But would it be fair to say that, but for the pressure mm. that you put on her in these ways, uh, to get your story, mm. that... But for that, she may never have gone public. I disagree with that, and I'll tell you why. First of all, there was a lengthy negotiation between Vicky Price and the Mail on Sunday before I even got anywhere well, near they were the story. In this as well. And she became frustrated because they weren't able to crack it. And so I was picking up where they had left off. And actually, on the eve of publication, the Sunday Times was a little bit nervous still. I mean, this was a high stakes stuff for us. And there was a suggestion about an hour before publication that we might not actually run the story. And when I phoned Vicky to tell her that, she absolutely exploded. She was very, very angry. So I believe, not that we were bounced into running the story because we were very happy with the way mm. it worked out, but I believe that that story would have got out there if we hadn't run it. But when you look at your lengthy email <clears throat> correspondence, uh, and uh, the attempts to tape record Mr. Hewn as well, uh, you providing the tape recorder and, and so on. Uh, some people may say you colluded with Miss Price to entrap Chris Hewn. Well, the tape recording was Vicky's idea. She was pretty rubbish with technology, and so the only reason that we gave her a tape recorder and it was nothing fancy, just a standard little piece of kit, was because I needed to show her which buttons to press. But you did collude, didn't you? I'm not sure I would use the word collude. What I did as a journalist was help her get the story she wanted out there into the papers. And let me say that it was always my hope that she would go on the record with this story. I wanted the story to be done in a simple way as possible. And you can see from the email correspondence that I always try to encourage her just to speak openly about what happened. And I still believe that that would have been the best approach for her. Did you fear, though, that because of what had happened to her, which was traumatic, and, and the bitterness that resulted, and the desire for revenge, did it make her somewhat unhinged? I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I say in the piece that I've written for the Sunday Times today that I think her judgment was clouded. But remember, this was a woman who was holding down a very high-flying professional job. And I think, like most of us, there were two sides to her personality. There are two sides mm. to her personality. There was the one that was very emotional, and there was the other that was very rational. And she was very clear what she was doing. Now, throughout, you said mm. to Vicky Price that the chances of her being prosecuted were low. Well, mm. hang on a minute. Actually, that was a very early email in the correspondence mm. before we talked to our own lawyers. Later on, I say that there is some mm. risk to her whichever way we do the story. Some risk. Well, it turned out to be a huge risk. It's not it? my job, nor is it the job of the Sunday Times, to provide expert criminal advice to a, <coughs> to a source of a story. Now, we now know that Vicky was taking expert advice from a judge. You can't get better than that. Do you think, though, that you had a, that you had a duty of care to really spell out to her the risk she was running, rather than, even after you got the legal advice, to somewhat downplay them? 
we didn't know the risk because we're not criminal lawyers. And I, I felt absolutely that I had a moral obligation to her to make it clear that there was a risk to her in us running the story. And I fulfilled that obligation. And remember, the Sunday Times didn't actually identify mm. Vicky Price. That was then the Mail on Sunday, as I understand it. The Mail on Sunday didn't identify her either. Ah. What happened was, after we published our story, mm. in which we honoured every bit of our agreement to protect her, Vicky then went to the Mail on Sunday and outed herself to them. It then became, I think, rather okay. inevitable that her identity became exposed. Would, would come out. I, I can see that. <clears throat> she says that she told senior Lib Dems, such as Vince Cable and Mrs <clears throat> Clegg, that Mr Hewn had forced her to take the points. They've denied it. Do you believe her? Well, you know, it's not for me to contradict the account from Vince Cable. You've seen the email. Mm, what, did you, it, what do you think? Well, it's interesting. Well, my instinct is that she did tell them. But as she says in the email, Vince was very tired last uh, on that particular night. And I suspect that perhaps he didn't take it in. Do you have any contact with her now? The reason I don't have any contact with her is because once the police came, became involved, clearly I couldn't in any way be talking to her. Um, and the other thing was that as soon as we published our story, and every word of that story was approved by Vicky Price, mm. she cut off all contact with me. She was happy with the story, but once I had done it and that was what she wanted, that was it as far as she was concerned. When she is sentenced tomorrow, <clears throat> probably to a jail sentence, let's assume it is. What will be going through your mind? What will be going through my mind is how her family feel. I, I have no sympathy for Chris Hewn. Let's remember this story started with a lying cabinet minister and if he had told the truth, then that is where the story would but have what ended. About her? So <clears throat> what I will be thinking of tomorrow is her family and her children. Isabel, thank you. It's just after 11.30, you're watching The Sunday Politics.